Okay, so today we're going to be looking at designing a messaging system. So that could be WhatsApp, it could be WeChat, any of those. So let's jump straight in. So in the functional requirements, obviously we've got one-on-one -on -one chats. We also wanna be able to handle group chats. We also then wanna be able to handle uh, only a maximum of 150, as that allows us to make some, uh, some nice design decisions. We also want to have media sharing, so it's often very common to, to send photos or videos these days, so we have to be able to support media sharing. We also have to be able to support push notifications uh, so that if a user is offline and they receive a text, they can uh, get a, a notification if they opt in for that. And then we also have online and offline indicators, so if you're texting someone, you can see whether they're online or offline, very common to what you'd see in something like WhatsApp or WeChat. And then for the non-functional requirements, obviously we've got high availability. We always want the service to be up so that users can receive and send messages. And then as well, we want high scalability. So, you know, we want to deal with potentially hundreds of millions of users. So we want the system to be very scalable. So then running through the estimates, we've got our queries per second. So let's say we've got daily active users, 100 million. So 100 by 10 to the six. Then let's say the average number of daily messages sent per user. So let's say we've got 50 messages per day per user. And then we can say the average number of messages sent per day then is 100 million. So 100 by 10 to six times 50. Uh, if we know our exponent maths, that's going to give us 5 by 10 to the 9, so 5 billion messages sent per day. And then what we can do is we can divide that 5 billion messages by the number of seconds in the day, which we're going to get by multiplying 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. And so that's going to give us a um, queries per second of roughly 58,000. So we've got a reasonably high kind of QPS here. And looking at this storage estimate, we can assume an average message size of 150 bytes. And then so for the daily message storage, we've got 5 billion messages. We can then multiply that by the average size, which is 150 bytes bytes and that will give us roughly 750 billion bytes which roughly equates to 750 gigabytes and then obviously per day and so then we also have to take into account the media so you know we can estimate that the percentage of messages that include media so files images pictures is roughly 10 percent and so then we can say that the daily media messages is 5 billion multiplied by 0.1 so 10 percent so that's going to then be 5 by 10 to the 8th which is uh, 500 million and then we can also assume that maybe the average media size is roughly 100 kilobytes and so therefore we can calculate that the daily media storage is going to be 500 million times 100 kilobytes and that will give us roughly 50 terabytes per day and so that means the total daily storage will be 750 gigabytes from our messages plus the 50 terabytes from our media which will give us 50.75 terabytes per day and then we can assume that we're storing this for 10 years and then so that will give us a total storage of 50.75 terabytes times the number of days in a year, 365, times the number of years, 10, which would give us roughly 185 petabytes of data. So that's obviously a lot of data to store, so we have to take that into consideration when we're thinking of how we're going to store content in our application. So if we look at the database schema here, we've got a high level outline of some of the kind of core tables we'd want to have. Obviously in a production system, you could have a lot more and obviously a lot more detail, but here's just kind of a brief overview. So we've obviously got our users table, we can have an ID, a name, and maybe a last online spam. Uh, and then we can have our uh, devices table. So our devices would have an ID. We could also have a, a many relationship with the user. So a user could have many devices and then obviously a device would only belong to one user. We could have a device type, a registration date, and then maybe a last seen message ID. So I can, I'll discuss that later on because that's actually quite an important to have. And then we can also have this concept of conversation. So conversations span both one-on-one -on -one messaging and, and group messaging. So think of a conversation as a conversation between multiple people so it could be just one person texting another or a group of people texting and so this user conversations table facilitates that many-to-many -many relationship whereby a user can be part of many conversations and a conversation can have many users and then finally we've obviously got our messages uh, table here whereby uh, a user can obviously send many messages and uh, a conversation can obviously have many messages sent within it and so that's just a brief overview of the schema but obviously again you can go into so much more detail when we're talking about an actual production but for an interview setting this should cover the most and it's also quite nice to handle both one-on-one -on -one and group conversations with just uh, the user the conversations tables okay so let's jump into the architecture overview so the first thing we'll want to have is a gateway so you know in this application we'll have many different protocols so like http uh, on the application layer and tcp uh, which will be in the transport layer uh, and so those are two layers of the uh, open systems interconnection, the OSI model. And so that's a conceptual framework that provides a kind of a, a protocol agnostic description of how the various layers of the network stack combine to enable uh, network communications. So I definitely recommend reading up on that if you aren't already familiar with it. We also covered it in tech prep, so definitely worth reading up on before any interviews. And we could also introduce maybe rate limiting or load balancing here uh, within the gateway, or you could move that out into external services. So that's something for you to decide. But for here, I'm just going to leave it just with the gateway. And so for example, we could use like Amazon's API gateway. 
way here. The next thing we'll have then is the load balancer. So we're going to have a load balancer just to distribute the load among our uh, services. Okay, so the first service we'll have here is the user service. And so this will be a HTTP based service that handle kind of all user related information. So profile information, and you could also include like authentication here if you wanted or break that into an external service. Um, so but here we're just going to include authentication within the, the user service. And then for the database choice, um, you know, user information can be quite relational in nature. So I think, you know, going for an SQL database would be suitable. So something like MySQL or Postgres would work fine here. And then obviously we could introduce some sharding to handle the scale. Uh, and we could also replicate it in different uh, geographic regions. So we could take a multi-data center approach to handle the availability requirements. And then as well as the user service, we could also have the media service here, which is obviously being used to store the media that's being sent between users. And obviously, as we saw in the estimates, you know, we're gonna have to store a lot of data. So something like an object storage like S3 uh, would be quite useful here. And then as well, if we wanted to save costs, maybe we could run some analytics and know that, you know, if a, a piece of media is in access for a certain amount of time, then it's most likely never going to be accessed. So then we could move that into cold storage so something like you know Amazon S3 Glacier uh, and that could help you know reduce our storage costs over time. Okay and so the next service we're going to look at is the chat service. So the first thing to think of here is the pull versus the push model. So what's the pull? So that's kind of polling. So what is polling? So for, for example there's long polling and so in long polling it's where the client makes a request to the server and the server will then hold that request open so it hangs until new data is available or a timeout occurs. So once the client receives the new data so in this case uh, it'll be a message from someone else or a timeout signal it will then disconnect and then it will immediately send another request to connect to the server and the process repeats uh, and so this creates a near real-time effect but it does have the overhead of, of establishing you know http connections so that's always worth considering and then when we talk about the push model you know we're talking about something like web sockets so web sockets are a tcp based protocol that uses bi-directional full duplex communication and so this occurs uh, in the transport layer, unlike HTTP, which is at the application layer. So again, OSI uh, model is something you'd wanna maybe study and, and be able to discuss here. So WebSockets are lightweight uh, and it's where the client and server can independently send messages to each other. And uh, yeah, it's something super useful to know. And so then after comparing the pull and push mechanisms, I then always look at the kind of stateless versus stateful services. So a stateless service is one that processes each request independently without retaining any user session information. Uh, and so this enhances is the simplicity and, and scalability of those services and so stateless protocols include you know http uh, and it's where each request is treated independently so if you look at our user service here it doesn't matter which server our user connects to uh, as kind of ultimately the user database is the source of truth however in stateful services uh, it's these are services whereby they maintain session data across requests. And so this adds additional complexity. And so an example of a stateful protocols include, you know, TCP. For instance, let's say client A creates a WebSocket connection with chat server one and then proceeds to send and receive messages from that server until that client disconnects or the server goes down, client A will always be connected to that server. Okay, and so the reason why the chat service is pink is because that is a stateful service. And it is stateful because session information is retained between requests, whereby in, in the user service and the media service, there is no session information retained between requests and therefore they are stateless. And then moving on to the storage of the chat service. So for the messages, you know, we obviously saw in the estimates, we're dealing with a massive scale here. So I think maybe a no SQL database like Cassandra or DynamoDB might be a good use case. Uh, I believe Discord used Cassandra. So again, it, it just handles this massive scale, easy horizontal scaling, whereby if we were to use maybe a relational database instead, while indexing can be used to speed up data retrieval, uh, it does significantly slow down data insertion and updates, and especially in a high volume real chat application, you know, that becomes really important that we're able to write data really quickly. And so that's why I think maybe a NoSQL Cassandra or DynamoDB might be a good choice here. And so I'll also have an ID service and this service will be used to generate Twitter snowflakes. So uh, Twitter snowflakes are basically just IDs uh, that can be used in distributed systems for generating unique time sequence identifiers, you know, at high scale. Uh, I'm not going to go deep on how that works here. I'll leave a link uh, down below if you want to go deeper on it, but it's actually uh, really useful to know and can be used in many different system design interviews. And so the reason why we want this ID uh, to be globally unique and also time sequence is so that we can see the last seen message ID for each device so that if there are any new messages and its ID is greater than the current last seen ID, the device then knows it hasn't seen the message and then it can then 
process that message. But also it's super important that these IDs are unique as we don't want collisions happening. And so that's why the Twitter snowflake is a great way of doing it. So we're also gonna have some service discovery here. So we can use maybe something like Zookeeper to maintain a list of all the available chat servers and their statuses. And so this will allow each instance of our you know, messaging application. So each of our uh, clients to query the Zookeeper to discover you know, which server to connect to. So Zookeeper has a strong consistency model, which ensures that you know, all the clients see the same view of the server lists. Uh, as well as their statuses, you know, which is crucial for correctly balancing the load, ensuring you know reliability. And so, as well as that, we'll also have a mapping table, and this mapping table will literally be like the client ID as well as the server ID. And so that uh, if any other client wants to know where another client is, it can simply go to that mapping table and see which server they're connected to so that it can then send messages to that user. And so for this mapping table here, it's, it's gonna have a high uh, read. And so maybe something like Cassandra, uh, which is known for its exceptional scalability and performance. You could also use Redis, which is an you know, in-memory data structure store uh, that can be used as a database, a cache and you know, message broker. Uh, or you go again, go for Amazon uh, DynamoDB, the choice is yours, uh, but any of those would be a, a reasonable option. So we can go through a quick messaging flow now. So a user will connect to the gateway. They'll go through a load balancer that can then go to the user service, which will then authenticate them. They can then reach out to the zookeeper, which can then assign them to a particular chat server. That mapping can then be stored in the mapping DB. And then what the client can do, it, it is then mapped to a certain servers, uh, chat server. It can then send a message. That message will firstly, an ID will be generated for it from the ID service that will then be stored in the chat database. And then obviously as we support one-on-one -on -one as well as group chats, what will happen there is that message can then be sent onto queues representing other users. So if it's a group chat, it could be sent to all the users in that group chat. And because we've limited it to 150 users per group chat, it's okay to maintain a separate queue for each user. And so in this case, let's say client C is offline when that message is sent. Well, then what we want to do is send a notification. So then what can happen is that message can then be processed by the notification service, which can then forward the message on to, you know, Apple push notifications or Firebase cloud messaging or any other notification service it needs to notify for that user to know it's received a message. And then similarly, we could also say, let's say client B is online when user A is sent a message. That message can then be forwarded to the server that cl client B is on, and we can know this from the mapping table. And so the last thing we need to deal with is the presence. And so again, here we're gonna have a WebSocket connection for each user to a presence server. And here, what we're gonna use is we're going to use a heartbeat mechanism, which is a crucial crucial feature for maintaining you know, real-time user status uh, information. And so the, how the heartbeat mechanism works is each client will send a periodic signal known as a heartbeat to the present server. And this will usually contain information. So in our case, it could contain a user ID, an online status, as well as the, you know, their last online timestamp. So like the current timestamp. And so what can happen then is it can then store that in the presence database. So again, something like Cassandra or DynamoDB would work well here. And then it could also push it onto messaging queues where the other people that client is messaging can then know the status of that user. Is that person online or not? And then what will happen if the present server does not receive a heartbeat for a specified period of time, it can then insert an update into the database saying this person is no longer online. And similarly, it can update the clients who can then subscribe to a queue so that they get updates knowing when a user is online or not. And so that's the architecture overview. It's quite detailed. I try to push it a bit to keep it all in one image because I quite think it's quite nice to have just one mental snapshot of the overall architecture. You might need to listen to it once or twice, but I think it's a really nice diagram. And I think if you know this, you should be really well set for most interviews. And so then the final thing is looking at additional discussion points. So we've obviously, you can talk about end-to-end -end encryption. So, you know, you could maybe discuss the signal protocol, which ensures that, you know, the content of the messages and calls are secured and can only be accessed by the sender and the intended recipients. You could also discuss media file handling and go lot deeper here and cover topics like file compression, chunk data transfer, as well as the use of like CDNs. You could also talk about rate limiting and abuse prevention. So, you know, talk, discuss the mechanisms to prevent spam and abuse, such as, you know, rate limiting, behavioral analysis and user reporting and kind of blocking features. You could also discuss, you know, monitoring and logging and highlight the importance of both monitoring and logging for, you know, maintaining system health, as well as discussing, you know, what are the key metrics that you would want to monitor uh, in real time and, and know how you would use those logs for you know debugging and performance tuning. Similarly, you could also discuss you know uh, compliance and data re retention. So you could touch on the legal and compliance aspects, especially regarding data retention policies, you know user data privacy, and you know how the system could comply with regulations like GDPR. And then finally, you could discuss you know disaster recovery. So this could include you know deploying across multiple data centers, and you know kind of how how would you design a disaster recovery plan to handle you know data center failures. So hopefully this helped you better understand the messaging system design. If it did, like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. And if you're studying for an interview, check out techprep.app. We've got all your system design, data structures and algorithms, as well as theory questions. And I will see you in the next one.